Today, I'm bringing y'all a video that literally nobody asked for. Nobody asked. Today, I'm gonna be sharing with you all of my secret tricks up my sleeves of how I edit. <laughs> In order to make this video as coherent and as organized as possible, I'm gonna be first starting with my most frequently asked questions. So fonts, programs, softwares, etc., etc. Then I'm gonna go into a little bit of my workflow and then I'm gonna share with you a few quick tutorials on my most classic trademark editing things that I do. All the timestamps will be linked in the description. Let's get right into it. Yeah, get into it. Let's start off with what fonts I use. I I am very, 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 very picky with my fonts. I date and dump them on the regular, so there's no telling who my next boo thing will be. But my current boo things, actually I have one boo thing, one side hoe. My boo thing is Monarca in bold, and I always adjust the spacing to be closer because I think the font just looks cuter that way. And then my side hoe, She's, she's slowly gaining my favor, I will not lie. She is called Rinse Regular, and I really like the edgy, textured vibe of it, but um, she's new, so we still filling you out, but those are my two boos right now. <laughs> so yeah, take that what you will. <laughs> Another FAQ that I get very often is, Katie, where do you get your memes from? This is just a compliment. Thank you for asking me. I have been working many, many years to become fluent in memeology. One YouTube channel that I can actually recommend is Paul 4.0. This channel is the holy grail for Stan Twitter memes or reaction memes like this. Why did you take the car? I don't know. You don't know? Demons told me to do it. Who told you to do it? The demons. Or like this. To my ass, do the dash. Can you make it go fast? Fuck the fame, all I want is them bands. If she keep on mugging, I'm freaking hilarious. They are constantly posting multiple videos every single day, so the database is constantly expanding. The limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. But other than that, you just gotta stay updated on the culture. The two main ways that I keep my fluency up is binging Vine compilations and um, wasting my life away on TikTok. But like, I'm not sure if I recommend that. No shit. Another question that I get is where do I get my music? And <laughs> this is, I would say, like the most stressful part of making a YouTube video, but I think it's the most rewarding and the most important part, to be honest. Currently, I'm using SoundCloud and Thematic. They're both free music platforms. Thematic is especially geared for like content creators, so I really recommend that. The only thing is the search system for like finding the exact genre of music is kind of um, outdated so like you really have to like scroll and like listen to the songs I do think though from now on I am going to upgrade to epidemic sound I've kind of been pushing it off because like don't feel like whipping out my card information and stuff because you do have to pay for epidemic sound but I do think it's a business investment that I have to make but thematic and soundcloud I mean they've gotten me this far I freaking love them and I'll continue to use them along with epidemic sound so yeah a lot of you guys ask, where do I get sound effects? My process is usually while I'm editing, I'm like, hmm, a sound effect would be really freaking funny here. So for example, sorry. Oh. And then what I do, it's a rather complex process and I'm pretty sure it's not the most efficient, but this is what I do to avoid those sketchy YouTube video download sites because those are weird and I heard that people can get hacked through those. I look up the sound effect on my phone. I will just type a punch sound effect and then I screen record the video with the microphone setting off to ensure that the recording will only have the audio of the video you're screen capturing rather than picking up the background noise of your surroundings and like you having to say super still while like recording it. I airdrop that video from my phone to my Mac. I import it into Premiere and then I delete the visual so you're left only with the audio part of the video and voila, you just move the sound effect to wherever you want the exact punch 
make noise. Once you start doing this for a while, like you build up a library of sound effects and then you no longer have to screen record. Like you just have a library in your computer of all the things that you usually use. So that's the stage that I'm at now. And the final question in this FAQs section is what do I use to edit? Currently I use Adobe Premiere Pro to edit my videos and then Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop to edit my thumbnails. My school luckily offers all of its students like a free unlimited Adobe subscription. So I'm leeching off that like any broke college student would, but it's like this looming, glooming, impending doom that is slowly approaching me as my graduation date arises that I'm probably going to have to terminate my Adobe subscription and convert to Final Cut Pro once I graduate because it just makes more economic sense. And that stress of having to relearn an entire editing software when I'm so comfortable with Premiere Pro is like a huge stressful beast. So a resource that I've been using recently to both brush up on my current editing chops in Premiere and also slowly learn Final Cut Pro is Skillshare. Skillshare is a thriving online learning community that offers thousands and thousands of classes for curious and creative people like yourself. I know that for a fact because you're watching this video. <laughs> but seriously, they offer tons and tons of classes on video editing, photography, graphic design, productivity, and thousands more. I'm personally in the advanced video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro 2020 class with Jordi Vandeput. And oh my gosh, he is so sweet and lovable and funny. Oh, hi there. I'm Jordy. I'm uh, the maintenance guy here inside Adobe Premiere Pro. I can really tell he puts in a lot of effort to make this super straining and honestly draining act of 2D video editing into the most engaging 3D and fun thing that he can make it. So I really, really do love him as an instructor. Even for someone who uses Premiere Pro like literally every single day, I still learned so many nitty gritty tips and tricks that the seasoned professionals in this industry use on the daily to, you know, cut down the fat on their editing editing times and just edit more efficiently. And it's also super duper affordable. It's only $10 a month on an annual subscription and there's no ads, period, point blank, no ads, but it's even more affordable for the first thousand people, thousand lucky people ooh, to click on the link in my description to get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. It's really been helping me both invest in myself now and in the future. So if you're interested, please make sure to click the link in my description and thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Okay, so now that I've answered all your burning questions, let's get into the video editing workflow that I usually do when I am editing my own videos. Right after I film, I have to export my files from my SD card to my hard drive, and then I import those into a Premiere project. But I don't start editing because if you're working with Premiere, when you work with a ton of 1080p footage, it buffers, it suffers, and it crashes, and then you rip your hair out and scream and cry all night, and you give up. For example, um, so in order to prevent that, you should convert all of your footage to proxies before you start editing. Proxies are basically low res versions of your high res footage. Once you convert your footage to proxies, the Premiere Pro program is able to run so smoothly and it won't lag and it won't crash. So it's just so much easier to work with while editing. And the great thing is like once you click export, Premiere automatically turns off all the proxies and just exports your high res footage. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense. But the problem with proxies is that they take forever to make. This video, for example, I've been recording for about 40 minutes, right? So this 40 minute clip is gonna take 80 minutes to turn into a proxy. As soon as I'm done filming, I start the proxy process and I'll show you how to do it here. I'm gonna voice it over. Hey yo, voiceover Katie here. So you're gonna go select all of the footage you want to convert to proxies and then right click. Scroll down to proxies in the menu and then click create proxies. And after that, it's gonna ask you the settings you want your proxies to be converted to. And I always keep it to be QuickTime because that's the file type that I've learned Premiere works most smoothly with and the ProRes low res proxy. Then you hit okay. It should open up Media Encoder, which is the Adobe program that converts all of your footage to proxies. It's gonna automatically import all of your footage in there. You should hit the play button to just start the conversion and then it should automatically go through all of them. And all we have to do is wait for a long, long time. I usually take a nap during this time and my computer's just chugging away and making the proxies while I nap. And then when I wake up, they're all done. 
After you've awoken from your nap, I go back to Premiere, reselect all the footage I just made proxies for, right click, and scroll down to proxies just like last time. However, this time, instead of clicking create proxies, you're gonna hit attach proxies, which is going to make this menu pop up. All you're gonna do is hit attach in the bottom corner and then search for the file that matches the file name with proxy added at the end. Click on that and Premiere should automatically attach the rest of the proxies to the rest of your files. And in order to make sure that your proxies are being used while you edit, you have to make sure that this little icon, the toggle proxies icon with the two screens is turned blue. As long as that's blue, Adobe will be much, much faster and much smoother. And then the next day is when I actually start getting to work. This is a step that you probably all have heard of. It's called the rough cut. It's basically just where you go through all your footage for the first time. It's a fresh look. This is where I cut out all my million likes that I say as a freaking valley girl wannabe. Like it's so freaking annoying. Like how I talk like this. Like why do I do that? That all gets wiped away in the rough cut. After that is when my second and third and fourth and fifth, sixth, seven rounds of editing occur. This is the part where I spice up my bland, a boring chicken breast of a video with some seasoning, with some spices. This is where I add my zoom effects for when I really want you to focus on what I'm saying. This is where I add my text. I think that that adds extra personality to your video because you can kind of like make fun of yourself or bounce off your past self based on your editing self. And this is where I also add my memes and my sound effects to, you know, just make the video more flavored. The flavor. Oh my God. And then after that round of edits, I go back to add the music. If I'm like in a really dramatic scene, I want the viewers to feel like on edge, I use this music from Bad Girls Club. And then if I want it to be a stupid or funny scene, I usually add this track. And then when it's just like a mundane, I want it to be cheerful, chill. This is my favorite track to go to. But I've also recently discovered this one. And those are like my favorite go-to tracks. After the music is done, it's my favorite part of the video, which is color grading. Oh my gosh. I have always been like an avid photo editor. So to be able to make a video pretty is just like, you know, another extension of that obsession. Let me walk you through how exactly I color grade. I usually add an adjustment layer, which is an extra layer over all the footage. And that just makes editing the footage a lot more convenient because instead of changing the actual clip, you just add a layer over it. And if you end up not liking that layer, you can just delete it later rather than going into every single original clip and changing it back to the original setting. That can get very time consuming. And then on that adjustment layer, I apply a LUT, which is basically like an Instagram filter, but for videos, I just use one that I downloaded from the internet for free. I'll try to link it in the description, but there's a lot of free LUTs online if you just search around. And then I go through the different areas of my footage. If it's a vlog, obviously I'm gonna have to adjust a lot because I'm filming in different parts of my room and the lighting changes throughout the day. So you have to adjust a little bit accordingly to make sure that the filter looks constant throughout. I don't wanna go too in depth in this video about how I color grade because I think that would just get way too technical. But if y'all want an extra video about that, I can definitely make one, just drop a comment. Then after that, literally like how many rounds is that? Like four or five already? I watch it a few more times after that because I'm a freaking narcissist. To laugh at my own jokes, you know, a few times because I'm self-centered, convince myself that this video is worth watching. And I also try to get rid of like any extra typos or last minute pacing errors. Like I think this scene is just kind of boring so I take it out. This is where I just do those last minute edits. And then finally I click file, export, media, you queue it up. And that usually takes like an hour or two because Premiere, I don't freaking know. Everything takes, everything takes so long in Premiere. That usually takes hours, so I conk out. And the final part of this video is where I'm gonna be running through a few video tutorials on like my most common effects that I do. I think off the top of my head, the most common things that I use, the spherize effect, and then the vintage frame effect, which I use for a ton of my lookbooks. If you are a Premiere Pro user, this is probably where you wanna tune in. If you're not, I apologize. Maybe I'll make a Final Cut Pro once I switch over, but yeah. So let's get into it. This effect is for whenever I'm feeling, you know, silly, quirky. Shut the hell up, bitch. 
um, you go over to effects and you're going to want to search up sphere eyes and then you're going to drag that to the clip that you want to apply that effect to and once it's applied you want to go over to the effect controls tab and there you're going to scroll down to sphere eyes and you're going to notice like two settings that you can change within the sphere eyes function and that's radius and center of sphere and radius basically just determines you know how big the sphere eyes is so you're going to want to adjust that out until you're satisfied with how blown up your face is or whatever you want to emphasize is and then center of sphere is like the position in which you want the sphere to be on your screen so like usually i want it on my face or if i wanted it on poby shawty a little sad fatty if i'm moving and i want the sphere to be on my face you want to track that and how you track the sphere to make it move across the screen is you use keyframes so you're going to want to turn on this little timer button you see here and then every time you want the sphere to move with your face you're going to move it to make a keyframe so you click that little diamond and then you switch the position of the center of sphere to correlate with wherever your face is at that moment and that's how you cause the sphere to track your face so yeah in order to do the vintage frame effect, what I do is I go to YouTube on my computer this time and you look up whatever thing you want and add green screen at the end. So usually I look up Super 8 film green screen or vintage film green screen and that should pop up with a ton of green screen results and you choose which one you like. And then I use QuickTime Player to screen record. You click on QuickTime Player, you go to File, drag down to new screen recording and then I usually click and drag to cut out a little box so that once I hit the record button it'll only record what I traced out within that box then once you have brought it into Premiere you want to drag it so it's sitting on top of your original footage for which you want it to be framed within the vintage film screen once it's sitting on top you go over to effects and you're gonna want to search up ultra key and you're gonna drag that to the overlay clip and then once that's applied you go over to the effect controls tab scroll down to where it says ultra key and the key color right now should be set to black which we don't want because the green screen is freaking neon shrek colored and we want that key color to be neon shrek so what you do is you take the eyedropper tool and you drag it over to the actual frame and put it in a spot where it's fully green the program should detect it and change the key color to that neon green therefore making all of it transparent that's how i literally do any effect so the math formulas confused AF one or the breaking news one those are all green screens that I took from YouTube and I applied the ultra key effect so it applies for a lot of different things those are all of my biggest tips tricks secrets things on my sleeve that I use while I video edit thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video I really hope you enjoy it and I will see y'all next week